Oh hi, welcome back to my channel. My name is Wildcard. Thank you for being here and afford me the pleasure and privilege of entertaining you. It's Tuesday. Oh boy, what a week has been. It's time to look at the news for last week's rugby. <laughs> Get yourself a coffee or and popcorns. And uh, if you're uh, up north and live in hell right now, get yourself an iced coffee. But yeah. Oh, what a week of rugby. First up, rugby world rankings. Ireland skyrocketed themselves to the top of the spot, beating New Zealand for the second week in a row. <laughs> I still can't believe this word just came out of my mouth. Uh, you know, when I was growing up, there are three certainties in life. Death, taxes, and the All Blacks never losing at home. And on the weekend, I failed to figure out a way to avoid taxes, but the All Blacks did, did uh, lose to Ireland at home two games in a row. Yeah, so there's some changes in the weekend. Obviously, Ireland following that big wing, rock, skyrocketing themselves in the first place. France dropped to second place. They did not play at all. South Africa, despite winning against Wales, did not change at all. Some people were a bit disgruntled about that. Uh, the, the, the score margin is a bit too great for South Africa to get any points. Beating Wales, yeah, despite the fact that the Welsh play really well uh, and it's a formidable opponent for the Springboks, yeah, no points were exchanged. England had a bit of a move up over Australia, creating that big gap, 86.84 over Australia on the second, uh, on the sixth spot. Uh, Argentina also beat Scotland. Not enough points to be changed for any meaningful directions to be done on the uh, on the rankings. But yeah, big ones: Iron versus New Zealand. So obviously, uh, the score: New Zealand All Blacks, 22 points to 32, going down to Ireland. Ireland was the better team convincingly dominated the All Blacks in the first half and second half. The All Blacks looked like they were going to make a comeback, but the Irish big names uh, like Ty Burns stepped up and really stifled out the All Blacks, snuffed out that opportunity for a comeback, creating history. And uh, yeah, obviously this was a, a perfectly played game. No controversies. And uh, yeah, let's talk about the uh, the next, next piece of article. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> obviously, there were controversy in the All Blacks game. This, the All Blacks can't lose without any controversy. <laughs> Just kidding. Anyway, um, so obviously, Barnsley, we all know he's one of those referees who kind of marches the beat of his drum a little bit. And on weekend, he done, did that a little bit, created a lot of controversy with, the, with his decision in the second half to issue only a yellow card for Andrew Porter putting a upright high shot on Brody Retallick. Uh, the referee, Banzi, made a really, really clear call stating that the tackle was not dominant, uh, the, meaning that there was an absorbing tackle, meaning that you know Porter was standing his ground essentially. And as a result, he sees that as not dangerous, despite Brody Retallick suffering a broken cheekbone or fractured cheekbone. Uh, despite that, he deemed that it was a yellow card. Uh, there was a lot of arguing about the, the card should have been red because it's pretty similar to the week before. And also, under the current guidelines of the World Rugby, as I highlighted here, um, it's a red card. If the risk, the risk of a, uh, it, it, it basically, if the tack tackler have failed to bend into the tackle. And it's uh, that is enough to consider reckoners to for this to, to be interpreted a red card already. So the absorbing tackle, you know, is not really sufficient enough to mitigate that as to a, from a red to a yellow un, under the current guidelines of the World Rugby. So yeah, so based on this article writer, he thinks that it should have been a red. Uh, there is some talks about whether this approach from World Rugby is a bit too much. It's, you know, ma making the game a bit too, you know, this. The, the margin of error is too small, especially when it comes to accidents. Um, yep, that's for something for the World Rugby to look at. But Barnsley definitely made a very controversial call there as, you know, the, the a similar offense, very similar offense last week to the All Blacks was a red. And next up, we have a, uh, obviously, following the tackle, despite only getting a yellow card, injured Porter, he is cited to be... Uh, done, you know, he's, he's going to be hearing, uh, go, uh, going to a video court hearing tonight. So maybe after this video, maybe tomorrow morning, we'll get the results on this. But yeah, the, the tackle resulted in a fractured cheekbone and Brody Italic will be out 
for six weeks. So definitely, you know, being cited after that incident is definitely means that it's more than should have been more than a yellow card as well. Another indicator there. Uh, Brody Retallick, we just mentioned, fractured cheekbone. Um, yeah, he, he, he looked visibly in pain. One of the toughest guy in rugby. You can see this is directly after the the pain, uh, the impact. Um, yeah, really unfortunate. Six weeks will fall into the rugby championship as well. So he's going to be missing out probably more of the games, if not, yeah, if not most of the games of rugby championship. They have the Springboks coming up in a couple of weeks. The Wallabies coming up, um, I think towards the end, he might be back for that. But yeah, he's going to be definitely missing out a very important part of his career this year. Um, so just before the test match as well, Something that a big name that went missing was Scott Barrett, who played exceptionally well in the first test match, brought that physicality, brought that exceptionally high work rate. Many people attributed the, the, the win in the first match to Scott Barrett, Scotty Barrett's uh, high work rate. Um, but going into this match, he was initially named on, in the squad, but then he uh, he got he got um, ruled out before the test match uh, to a to a small injury, I think. Yeah, Achilles injury, and 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 it did it did show that the All Blacks was struggling in the lineouts, something that Scotty does quite well. Struggling in the more defense, something that Scotty is probably the best at in the All Blacks team. And also the breakdown was also a bit of an issue, especially in the second half when the game got a bit tough. So a lot of the key areas that Scotty Barrett brings for the All Blacks, yeah, the All Blacks lost without him so this was a very 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 significant moment significant loss to the all blacks team scotty barrett hopefully he'll be okay for the south african tour and then we have uh obviously there was a lot of hashtag 540 hashtag bring in uh razor the crusaders coach uh robinson so there was a lot of you know pressure from the from the coach so let's look at the initial reports so yeah, so initially the post-match conference, Fozzie basically said, you know, we got to get his defense for the loss was basically we, 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 the public needs to give more credit to the uh, to the Irish team, which is true. The Irish team is like that performance is one of the best performance from any team uh, in the history of rugby. That was an absolutely outstanding, brilliant performance by the Irish side. So clinical, so good uh, in everything: defense, attack, kicking game. Everything is just crisp crispy clean so Fozzy pointed that out essentially saying probably should give him a bit more points but then it still doesn't solve the, the the issue that you lost why is the Irish team better than the All Blacks who has to consistently be the best team in the world and obviously uh, Fozzy came out and tried to sort of shift the the focus a bit to give more credit to the Irish side uh, also there was a Typically on the on the Sunday there was a, a brief a debrief for the team public to the to the public for the uh, for the All Blacks that briefing was cancelled which stirred up even more uh, media storm as to why the, the thing was cancelled apparently this was not done by Fozzy because people were already calling for Fozzy's head uh, people thought that he was stuck in the media but apparently this was done by Joe Malcolm uh, she was. The manager, like basically the press manager, decided to cancel it and decide. And basically, she decided to cancel it because there was already so much negativity towards Foster and the captain Sam Kane. She felt like the team needs some time off to think about it before getting, you know, destroyed again by the media. Essentially, yeah. Uh, next up, we've got. Uh, yeah. So obviously, this was basically a funeral in New Zealand. The boss of New Zealand Rugby, Mark Robinson, also came out, said this was not acceptable. And yeah, calling for changes, calling for, you know, you know, immediate work to be done. So we shall see how the World War is going to work. They got two really difficult games coming up next. There's no talks, there's no, you know, any sort of uh, direct indication as of yet if Scott Robinson is going to come in or if Fozzie is going to step down, but they are basically saying they're, we're doing something in the back back end of it. Uh, second test on the weekend, Wallabies versus England, 17 points to 21. Uh, uh, one of those games where I did feel like, yeah, the big names of the England side stepped up and the Wallabies, yeah, really lacked a bit of leadership, especially in the second half. Uh, Courtney Laws 
outstanding in the second half. I, I you know, he, he stepped up as a captain for Owen Farrell. Absolutely brilliant. Uh, showed his leadership skills with his, you know, actions. Uh, Billy Villampola, after, you know, taking about a year or something off from the England team, being dropped, finally gets back in the fold and showed why he wants to, wants to stay in that number eight jersey this game. Did a lot of work for the England side and uh, and a very good Eddie Jones impression. So England, yeah, well-deserved win, 21 points and 17. A couple of very outstanding performances by the big names. Uh, saw them pull through. And obviously, you know, we have a lot of fun here in Australia. Uh, you know, forget about what the media says, but there are some pretty, pretty, pretty rowdy people at the Sydney, Sydney Cricket Ground on the weekend. I probably would have done the same thing if I was there, to be honest. Uh, so there was a guy apparently on the roof of the stadium piecing into the crowd. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, not a joke. This guy was piecing into the crowd and he's got a two-year ban from the SCG. Not, not to mention how, I don't know how he got up to the roof. Um, but yeah, what what a what a fun time as, as, at the SCG, right? So he gets uh, that, but more... Rowdy incidences happen at the SAG. So uh, let me just turn some of these off. So that hopefully I stop lagging a little bit. It's just super laggy. Anyway, I think that should be fine. So obviously more incidents. Uh, we should watch this quick video. So basically, Eddie Jones was walking out on sideline and this guy, this guy with the yellow hat, calls him a traitor. I wish you can watch this. I think there's a, yeah, there's a video. Uh, and then Eddie Jones, let's see what it is. I think everybody's probably seen this. <laughs> oh Jesus, <laughs> this guy's just like, oh, no. moral of the story guys, don't mess with my dad. He will eat you alive, okay? So following this, Instance. So apparently this is only one of the instances that was caught on camera apparently uh, later on after he walked away he was called the tra traitor again and this time he basically told them to you know to go fuck themselves uh, all the f-bombs out of the drop so apparently there was another incident as well right after this one so edit yeah more of the story guys don't mess with my dad sir eddie will mess you up okay will mess you up and 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 also uh, it's reported by Fox Sports as well. Despite the trade accord and all, also on that, Sir Eddie uh, is expecting to be returning to Australia after his um, after his run as head coach with England, which ends in 2023. He's already said he's going to step down as the head coach for England after the Rugby World Cup. He's actually currently in line to be the uh, to be the Rugby Australia's new director of rugby. So yeah, I'm uh, really excited to see. My dad finally come home and fix the Rugby Australia and get rid of the rot. Uh, so this is actually a really weird kind of interesting turn of events as well because we had a, we had a uh, what do you call it, director of rugby that was let go. Essentially, the, the role was made redundant last year. Um, yeah, they made the role redundant last year. This was, this was introduced by Michael Checker um, under Raylene Castle like a couple of years ago. And then the role was made redundant last year, essentially. And then now they're going to bring it back for Sir Eddie. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's that's just Rugby Australia for you. They just, um, yeah, they make a role redundant. And then they're just like, hey, hey, Sir Eddie, you want to come back? <laughs> We've got a, a role here that we can uh, offer you. Uh, yeah, anyway. Ah, so this was a really nice little bit of a story as well. So they're basically, uh, you can go watch this if you want. I don't want to play the full video. It's quite like nice bit of a story. So basically, um, obviously, uh, Justin Harris Harrison was at the 2003 Rugby World Cup where they lost second place to England. That was a very, very emotional day. I could totally understand it. And he basically threw the medal into the Sydney Harbour. And he regrets till this day that he done so. Uh, as he, you know, he has two boys now. He has nothing to show for from the second place. His boys, you know, and um, basically he's making this video. Like he's like making this, uh, like you know, making this, in having this interview, talking about his 
um, his, his, his time in the Wallabies and so on. And then the, you know, the, what do you call it? The CEO of, um, no, not him, but what was his name? But anyway, what was his name? Um, but anyway, this guy, what's his name? I can't remember his name, but he, 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 I forgot to highlight his name. But, but, oh yeah, Jeff, Jeff Bucket, right? Yeah, RFU Jeff Bucket, that's right. Um, he, he, he basically contacted World Rugby and had another medal made a rep another medal made silver medal made and presented to him and he was just in tears this was a really really beautiful moment go watch it it was uh quite a nice moment yeah i, I can totally understand how why he threw it away like if that was me i would have thrown it away but um yeah uh, it really showed how much he means to him and uh, they made a medal for him and <laughs> yeah uh quite quite a nice moment there uh, and then obviously we moved to south africa after you know two of the southerner teams have lost south africa was you know entrusted to be the welsh this was a very 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 good performance by the stream box in the first half second half we had so this was uh really good the the the, the first half was basically a test performance by the stream box really don't really control the game uh dominant the welsh up front but the second half looked a bit shaky there was a bit of a unnecessary kick in the second half and welsh was eventually what put away by the Springboks overall dominance and this was a very entertaining very 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 good game so the obviously the um this means that the Springboks beat the uh sorry the, the Springboks beat the Welsh two to one for the series uh despite the series win for the Springboks there's still a lot of talk about that second test being the first time the Springboks ever lost to Wales at home um, so there was a bit of a discussion to why this was necessary. Uh, obviously, in the second test, the Springboks brought in essentially like the B team changed up just about every just about everybody was subbed out. It was 14 changes in the starting team, and like <clears throat> additional five players were changed in the, in the bench. Uh, so Rassi Erasmus in his post match kind of summary for this team is basically saying that you know with with the decision that was made in the 14 players, they learned a lot. They they got a better idea of how the newer players. Or are traveling under the team uh, and it was pretty obvious in the second test they had a strategy that was mirroring the springbok strategy in the third test but it was just executed with different people and obviously the clinicalness the accuracy wasn't quite there to be the level that was done in the third test so obviously they try to see how people are going to perform in that environment <clears throat> uh but uh rassi rasmus argument for the changes decision he's on a bit of a fire a little bit is that they are able to learn from the mistake uh, from they're able to get a better idea and learn from the loss if they won there's nothing there's very little value for the spring box uh if they just put on the a team and do what they did in the third test there's very little value for the for the team that's basically his argument uh however jake white uh disagrees so so i kind of this two sides of the story here as well so jake white kind of follows the the traditional uh traditional idea that if, you, if a player has selected the team in the first place, they should have been enough to be to be in the. They should be in, enough. You already. They, they should be good enough already. You don't have to test them out to see if they can. You know, if they they're worthy to be in the starting team. They should already be good enough to be in the starting team. That's what you selected them. And the whole point of like these tests is to take them seriously and to work your combinations and give you know game time to the combinations. That you're gonna play with and make them give them you know allow them to familiarize to mature as a team so to, to have that consistency as a team so he did point out that you know the clive woodward did this in the 2013 rugby world cup in fact he pointed out you know rassi did this before the 2019 world cup himself he's obviously criticizing jack and Ninamba here um and then he's uh also talks about you know how, how some of the players are selected into the team and then almost like they've been treated like not really worthy yet even though you're selected uh he sort of mentioned joseph dweber here i i, I did feel like there's this one thing i did feel like i, I do kind of have to agree with jake white here is that the whole point of you selecting like a whole squad of like 32 or 35 players is you know the players are already good enough to be as a team it's not a you know 35 player in the, in the squad and there's an a and a b team in the squad 
that's really not good for cohesion. So I, I do think Jaquai probably has a point here. They probably should have blended the player players a bit more throughout the three tests and have like a better structure of, you know, better like, you know, you, 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 to test out different combinations with the opportunity instead of just going, all right, now the whole B team goes onto the field for the second test and let's bring back the A team. Like we're, you know, showing this clear division between an upper tier and a second tier within the same squad. Uh, that's kind of like what Jake Weiss alluding to a little bit here. That's probably something that, yeah, I do feel like, you know, it's, it's almost like congratulations, Joseph Dweba, you made it to the spring box, but not really, you're still in the B team in the spring box because you won't, you know, it's, it's kind of like, it's really like, yeah, it, it doesn't really help with cohesion a little bit as well in that regard. So there's a bit of um discussion there between the disagreement there between Jake White and the current approach uh, of the Springbok side. Uh, obviously, there was a big injury out of the third test, a fractured jaw by, um, uh, what do you call it? Cheslin Kobe. He went into tackle. This is a poor, really, this is a really poor tackling technique. He put his... He put his head in front of the knee. So you always want to put your head on the outside hip, not on the inside hip. As he's done here, he's put his head on the inside hip, cracked his own jaw. You always want to put it on the outside hip. So this is a, a bit of a tackling tech issue here. Sometimes you see players do this, make this sort of tackle, putting the head in front. If it's there really close to the try line and they really wanted to shut out the player from getting over the advantage line, they sometimes do this just to, to put the head on the wrong side to try to shut the player out that extra bit of a uh, distance from getting over the gang line when they're really close, like if they're defending the try line to get over the try line. But it's, it's yeah, it, it is considered uh, a poor technique, but players still do that uh, in certain situations. So yeah, this is, uh, yeah, don't do this at home kids. Uh, well, I guess you have to tell your kids not to do that. Okay, I assume all of you are, anyway, next up, oh, we've already talked about this. So next up, the, um, there was some talks about the pitch at the Springboks uh, game. B even before the test match, Kitsov has talked about the ground being a bit soft uh, due to the rain season in Cape Town. And it did show a lot, a lot of slipping on the field. And uh, yeah, they probably have to do something about the grass. Uh, maybe a bit too short or something, but it definitely was very slippery. And it looked like, you know, you know, sometimes the ground gets a bit drenched. People, it just kind of like slows down. A little bit you don't slip that much but this was yeah almost looked like the the players were running on carpet a very short looking grass uh but anyway next up so obviously the the thing that i kind of mentioned i kind of noticed and i even talked about in my pre post match review as well gareth anscombe was not in the game i didn't know what happened i thought they just didn't put him on the field but he did suffer a um he did suffer a injury what do you call it? Um, he did just have an injury in training before the test. Uh, as a result, Reese Patchell was on the bench and Rat Patchell was not on, did not get put on the field at all. So yeah, the Anscom would have been a big difference, could have been a bit of difference for the Welsh, give him a bit more spark. He did really, really well in his second test for the Welsh team to uh, set up that try in the end. Uh, and finally, the, th the fourth test for the Southerners, Argentina versus Scotland. This was an amazing game by Argentina. Uh, Michael Checker has turned the team around. Essentially, the 34 points of 31. Essentially, this was a very, very, very good performance by Scotland team. Scotland was leading by 15 points. And uh, Argentina was able to come back with uh, with a win. Yeah. Uh, and they scored a match-winning try in the final minutes or so. They had a penalty advantage going for a scrum. And just, yeah, a perfectly executed set play. Uh, ball goes out to the wing, space out wide. And um, Bofelli goes in for the try for Argentina to win the test match. A uh, very, very historic moment. A lot of us, even me, thought Argentina probably wasn't able to do it. Uh, because going to this match, uh, Michael Checo had a, plenty of injuries, 11 changes to the side. There were a few key names being uh, being left out of the team because of injuries like Sanchez and Kubeli. So yeah, um, already starting, not looking good, but Michael Checker really, you know, I think having Pablo Matera return as a captain as well, really showed a lot of leadership for the Argentinian side. I can't wait to see Argentina perform in the rugby championship now with Checker at the helm. 
And uh, also, if we go to the next part, um, Chile has qualified for the Rugby World Cup over the United States. Yeah, the USA is going to be missing out on the Rugby World Cup in a very huge, another huge upset on the weekend. So basically, it's, it's the, the, the qualification process is that the two teams will play one away games, uh, one home, uh, you know, one away game. So each team gets to play the, there's two test matches and both teams get to play the test match at home. So two ten, and then the cumulative point difference will decide the winner essentially. Unless you know, yeah. So so basically, the 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 overall point difference will be used to consider the difference after the two te test matches. Uh, the America, America, the USA upset Chile last week with the one point win in like horrendous weather and conditions, and then and if there was like a power outage and and so on. Uh, but in the second test at home in Denver for the United States, they came out with a 19 nil win. 19 nil uh, lead only to lose 31 points to 29 and the thing is last week the, the america only beat chile by one point and so so the week before sorry so this week or the week that just went past or the weekend just went past america lost by two points so the point difference is that chile was is we is ahead by one so as a result chile qualifies for the rugby world cup by one point over the united states Man, that is painful. To, to, to just lose at home is already pretty painful. But to lose at home after being 19 points up, three tries already, that's, that's, that is... And also to lose at home by just enough points so you don't qualify for the Rugby World Cup, that is, that is, man, that is really, really, really painful. That is torture. Um, yeah, it's really unfortunate for the United States. Uh, next up... The Pacific Nations Cup, Samoa beat Fiji with another comeback, believe it or not. Uh, so they were down 17.3 at half time to beat Fiji and to become the winner of the um, Pacific Nation Cup. They did beat the Wallabies in the first round as well. Not the Wallabies, the Australia A team in the first round as well. So yeah, well-deserved undefeated season for the Manu Sa Samoa team. Really, really good performance. So they become the winner for the... Uh, Pacific Nation Cup, and the next up we have uh, what's the next one? Oh yeah, so this is uh, the the last week from America. Uh, finally, 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 Spain not giving up on their World Cup, going for another appeal to the Court of Arbitrations for Sport to um, to basically so they basically had an appeal already, and World Rugby re declined the appeal based on the fact that some of the evidence that was presented in the appeal should have been presented in the initial hearings that Spain failed to present. So the World Rugby are uh, basically saying, too bad, you should have presented this initially. and uh, We're not gonna just reconsider this evidence after you fail to prepare for the for them in the initial, um, initial hearings, but they're going to try again to appeal to, a, to the Court of Arbitration for Sport for another chance. And essentially uh, on May the 26th, the Spanish Rugby Federation, and uh, basically the player involved is Gavin Van D Vandenberg. He was allegedly uh, faking his past, like his you know passport. He travel history on his passport uh, to show that he had qualified for residency, even though he wasn't. He was traveling around Europe, posting on Instagram about his awesome you know South Asian Europe uh, trip, and then you know as a result he was il il eligible. In edu not eligible for the Spanish uh, national team and then the Spain national team basically came out and said they were misled by the player and the club so they expelled the club um, Van der Berg is in the uh, Al Alcor Bendas uh, on the on basically on misleading them with falsifying entry um, on the player's passports for uh, to fulfill the criteria eligibility. So the, the Federation of the Spang Rugby Federation is essentially claiming that they were misled themselves as the considering facts for World Rugby to reconsider the position for um, for the qualification for the Rugby World Cup. There you go. But it, it, it's, I don't think it's going to happen because Romania has already been confirmed as the confirmation, if they revert the decision, what they're gonna do, they're gonna 
play Romania again, I guess. I think maybe that's what's going to happen um, to, to decide, I guess. But yeah, anyway, that's uh, that's the news for the week, guys. Thank you for watching. I do appreciate being here. Like, comment, and subscribe. We have like a couple weeks off, so I'll try to put out some random stuff, maybe, if I'm, if I'm not too lazy. But thank you for watching, guys. I appreciate you being here. Like, comment, and subscribe. Have a very nice week, and uh, I'll see you guys. I'll see you guys soon. Cheers.